Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Sakarani, and I work for the Office of Civics and Community Services here at the Los Angeles Public Library. Welcome to today's program with the Los Angeles Alliance for Economic Inclusion called Buying a Home. Today, Mary Duran, Rihanna Rodriguez, and Cheryl Ryman from the Los Angeles Alliance for Economic Inclusion will go over the process involved in buying a home, including information on loans, mortgages, making an offer, and closing on a home. We will have a brief Q&A after the presentation, so please send us your questions throughout the program. Thank you, and take it away, Mary. Thank you, Caroline. And if we could have the slide, and there we are. Uh, I want to thank you and thank the Los Angeles Public Library for hosting the FDI, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Los Angeles Alliance for Economic Inclusion on today's workshop about buying a home. Next. I want to share this disclaimer with you that this presentation represents the views of the speaker and not necessarily those of the agencies they represent. This presentation cannot be reproduced or distributed by a third party or on a third party website without prior authorization. Reference to any specific organization does not constitute an endorsement, a recommendation, or a favoring by the FDIC or the United States government. Next. As Caroline mentioned, today's objectives are to share with you the steps in buying a home, how to know if you're ready to buy a home, estimating how much you can afford, what kind of housing finance options are there, what are some of the key costs involved, how to become pre-qualified or pre-approved for a mortgage, and how to compare loan estimates. Additionally, there's many professionals involved in the process, so you'll learn about their roles in helping you become a homeowner. The process of making an offer, negotiating with the seller, and closing the purchase. And where to get help if you have trouble making your mortgage payments afterwards. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first pre presenter, Cheryl Ryman. Cheryl? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Mary said, my name is Cheryl Ryman, and I'm the Community Development Officer for Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach. We're excited to share information today from the FDIC Money Smart Program on buying a home with you today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we're going to discuss how to get ready to buy a home and how to figure out what you can afford. Next slide. So the key takeaway from this section is that buying a home is a process. It, it's not like going out and buying shoes. It's a process. Start by making sure that you're ready to buy and figure out how much you can afford. Next slide. So step one, decide if you're ready. I mean, are you really ready? Um, you can always reevaluate this decision later on throughout the process and then figure out how much you can afford. Um, it will save you time and heartache, uh, trouble down the road. If you have a good sense of what price range you want to focus on in your search for a home and absolutely check your credit history. This is so important. We can't emphasize this enough, how important your credit history and the resulting credit score is in your ability to finance a home and how much you're going to pay for it. Not just whether you get approved, but how much you end up paying for that in your interest rate based on your credit score. Lenders use your credit history to determine whether they will lend and how much that loan will cost you overall. You can go to www, the website's here, www.annualcreditreport.com to review all three of your credit reports. That website is the only place you can go to get the free credit reports from the three nationwide credit reporting agencies that you're entitled to at least once every 12 months, although right now they're still available every week. Checking your own credit report does not affect your score. So that's really important to know. And again, that, that website is www.annualcreditreport.com. Step two then, is figuring out your financing. Learn about mortgages and financing options, which we're going to talk about today. Shop around 
and get pre-qualified or pre-approved. And we'll talk about the differences between those terms in just a moment. Next, please. <clears throat> then the fun begins. So you, you're ready to buy, you've checked your credit, you've determined how much you can afford, now you're going to shop for your home. So put together your team, and it really does take a team, right? Identify and consult with professionals that can help you search for, finance, and, and finally purchase your home. And they'll find you a home that fits your needs that you can afford. Then you actually buy your home, right? So you found the home that you're interested in. You're going to make an offer on the home, right? And then you're going to maybe negotiate with the seller and then consider getting a home inspection, which we strongly encourage. And then finally, escrow closes. That's, that's when you become officially the homeowner. Then it doesn't stop because now you have to maintain your home, right? You've worked hard to get it, so protect your investment. While we're not going to talk a lot about that in this module, home maintenance helps keep the value of your home and reduces the risk of more costly repairs. Next slide, please. So how much can you afford? Really, only you can decide. And be careful because there are some individuals in the industry who, when you're talking about financing, will maybe possibly encourage you to spend a little more than you're comfortable with. But you have to make that decision, right? And don't go into something that you can't afford comfortably. So when it comes to what's affordable for you, you can take the advice and guidance from others, but you make the decision. We're going to talk about two ways for you to be able to estimate your affordability, right? So there's a spending and savings plan, figuring out what you have left for housing costs after you pay for all of your other expenses, and then your debt to income ratio, figuring how much of your income, right? So you have a pool of money coming in, would go to covering your monthly debt payments, and that includes the payment for your home loan. So making sure that you have enough income to cover those expenses. Next slide, please. Now, when we talk about a mortgage, a mortgage is a home loan. You pay back the loan with your monthly mortgage payments. Now, with your monthly mortgage payments, um, that's definitely going to be the largest part of your housing expenses. When you buy a home, though, your mortgage payment generally has four parts, commonly referred to PITA. That's principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. <clears throat> so the principal amount is the amount of money that you borrow. So if you borrow $500,000, your principal of that loan is $500,000. Now you're going to make payments though, and your payments are going to be less than that. That's going to be annualized out. But with that monthly payment, you're going to have interest. You're going to pay interest on that loan. Then you're going to have property taxes, real estate taxes, that may be part of your mortgage payment. <clears throat> and your homeowner's insurance may be part of your mortgage payment. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute also. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so when we're talking about the debt to income ratio, it's a tool to estimate whether you can afford to borrow the amount of money that you need to buy the home. It's a calculation and it's often written as a percentage and it shows how much of your gross income and that's the amount before any taxes or any other deductions are taken out how much of your gross income goes towards covering the, your monthly debt payments. So do you have student loans? Do you have an auto loan? Do you have credit card debt, right? So all of that's calculated into that monthly debt amount. <clears throat> uh, and then they factor in your anticipated monthly housing payments. And when the lenders look at your debt to income ratio, they may have their own way of calculating it. I mean, we could sit here and do the math, but each lender has its own standards, which is why it's important to shop around. Uh, for example, some lenders may treat student loans differently from other loans. And that's why it's important that you talk to those lenders so that you understand how they make that calculation. 
so that if you need to make some pay downs, if you need to make some adjustments, that you know what your target is. Generally speaking, so if your debt to rate income ratio is 40%, that means 60% of your gross income is available to cover everything else. Different lenders have different standards for what they will accept as a debt to income ratio. Some lenders prefer a debt to income ratio of 30 36% or less. Other lenders might accept up to 43%, depending on your credit score and other factors. So shop around. We can't say that enough. For most households, keeping debt to income ratio lower rather than higher definitely provides more stability and financial security, right? Okay, next slide, please. So here's an example. Uh, when you're looking at total monthly payments are $2,045, but the monthly gross income is 3,750, you take those and divide and then turn that into a percentage. So here you can see that the debt to income ratio is 54.5%. Now, could this person afford a home? Uh, probably not. The debt to income ratio is likely too high, right? Based on the pre preferences of most lenders. So they could try to reduce debt if they owe on credit cards or a car. Maybe they need to wait a little longer until they pay down that debt before they're able to actually buy a home or look for a less expensive house uh, or make a larger down payment so that you're actually having to borrow less. Now, that's all ideal and, and not more easily said than done, but definitely understanding that. Another option is to increase income. Maybe ask for a raise or take on a second or, or a third job. I don't know. You know, whatever it takes to get into the house, but don't overextend yourself. That's, that's really, you know, it's really important. You need to be able to be comfortable in your home, not suffer for buying it. Next slide, please. So section one, remember the key takeaway. Buying a home is a process, right? There's going to be a lot of people involved in that. But start by making sure you're ready to buy and figure out what you can afford, right? And so with that, I'm going to turn it over then to Rihanna to cover section two with us. Hi, thank you, Cheryl. So for section two, this section, we will discuss identifying different loan types, define the loan terms and concepts, and describe how mortgages work and how to shop around for a mortgage. Next slide, please. So know your loan, learn about your financing options for buying a home and shop around to get the best deal for you. Next slide, please. So a mortgage is a loan to buy your house, condo, or townhome. Principal is the amount of the money you will borrow. Some or many of the costs associated with taking out a mortgage include interest, points, fees, or other charges. Interest is the cost of using money borrowed expressed as a percentage. Points, some lenders may offer you the option of paying points so you can pay more money up front. You receive a lower interest rate and you'll likely pay less money over time. And when I say over time, that would be the length of the loan. Points can be a good choice for people who know they will keep the loan for a long period of time. The fees can include lender charges for processing your application. They may have different names such as application fees, processing fees, or underwriting fees. And other charges could be anything from an appraisal to determine the value of the property or other type of um, reports that would need to be done or evaluations that would need to be done on your property. The lenders will tell you the annual percentage rate or APR for the mortgage you are considering. The APR represents the overall cost of the loan on an annual basis. The APR includes not only the interest rate, but also the points for some of the fees you are charged and certain other charges that you have to pay to get the loan. And for that reason, your APR is usually higher than the interest rate. 
APRs can help you compare loans. Next slide, please. The down payment is a portion of the purchase price of your home that you pay in cash. So for example, if you want a home for $160,000 and paid $8,000 for a down payment, you would borrow $152,000, which would be $60,000 minus $8,000, your down payment. That would be 5% of the down payment. $8,000 divided by $160,000 equals 0.05 or 5%. Needless to say, the higher your down payment, the less money you would have to borrow. Next slide, please. In some instances, you may have private mortgage insurance or PMI. When your down payment is less than 20% of the purchase price, lenders may require that you have PMI. Private mortgage insurance is different than your homeowner's insurance. Homeowner's insurance pays for loss and damages to your property of something unexpected happens, like a fire or a burglary. PMI would lower the risk to the lender on a residential loan made to you, similar to gap insurance for your vehicle. PMI increases your monthly payment. The lower your down payment as it relates to the purchase price of your house, the more likely you will have to pay PMI. And terms of your loan will specify how long you must pay PMI. For some loans uh, require that your PMI be paid until a certain percentage of your loan is paid off. Other loans may specify a period of time required for the life of the loan. Next slide, please. As discussed, several parts of the mortgage payment earlier, such as principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, or PITI. Now let's talk about taxes and insurance. There are two common ways to pay the real estate um, or property taxes on homeowner insurance premiums. That would be your escrow as part of your monthly mortgage payment or pay them yourself. Sometimes your lender may give you the choice of paying your taxes and insurance yourself or having an escrow account. More often though, the lenders will require that you have an escrow account. This is not to be confused with the escrow process often involved in the real estate transaction between the buyer and a seller. This reference is specifically related to the lender holding your prepayment of funds for property taxes and insurance once escrow closes on the buy and sell of the transaction. Even if, even if you aren't required to use an escrow account, you may find it easier to do so so you don't have to worry about making payments when they are due. And generally speaking, property taxes are due biannually. <clears throat> Your lender or mortgage servicer may add the amount to your mortgage payment and deposit the money installments for taxes and insurance into a mortgage escrow account. Then they use the funds in the account <clears throat> to pay your taxes and insurance bills when they come due, typically once or twice a year. Your property taxes and homeowner's insurance premiums can change from year to year, so your escrow payment um, with it and the total of your monthly payments may also change. Next slide, please. So let's discuss different types of mortgages. For a fixed rate mortgage, and this means that one in which the interest rate does not change, you will pay the same amount each month in principal and interest for the life of the loan. Even if interest rates rise, your payment does not change because your interest rate stays the same. That's why it's considered fixed. Don't forget, though, that even fixed rate mortgage <clears throat> mortgages, your payment may likely increase if you haven't increased your escrow account due to tax, uh, taxes or insurance premiums or either both of those increasing. The terms of a fixed rate mortgage are often anywhere between 15 to 30 year, although there may be different lengths available. And you can always discuss the different terms with your lender. This kind of mortgage may be good choice if your interest rates are low and if you plan on keeping the mortgage for a long time. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. For an adjustable rate mortgage, your mortgage may start with a lower interest rate than the fixed rate mortgage, but your interest rate and therefore your monthly payment will likely change. They can go up and sometimes by a lot. The rate adjusts on predetermined dates for example, every year or every three years or five or seven. 
and this is tied to an index. The index is common standard interest rate. This is often expressed as a number, such as a 3-1 or 5-1 arm. The 3 or the 5 would stand for the number of years the interest rate will stay the same, and the 1, that's the interest rate could change every year or the first three years. A 3-2 arm means the interest rate stays the same for three years, and then it can change every two years. An arm may be good, it may be a good choice if you plan to keep the mortgage for a short period of time. An arm is not a good choice if you cannot afford to pay more if the interest rate goes up. If you're considering an adjustable rate mortgage, be sure to carefully review the consumer handbook on adjustable rate mortgages, the brochure that the lender will provide you, or you can preview it. You just Google www.consumerfinance.gov. Um, we will also provide a resource page for you, so there'll be some additional websites for you. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Mortgages can also be classified as either conventional, government guaranteed, which is some kind, sometimes called government insured. So for a conventional mortgage, you do not have to have special requirements. Um, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, there does not have to be special requirements for the borrower, such as having served in the military or living in a rural community. They're available to anyone, but they may be more difficult for some people to qualify for than other types of mortgages. In general, you need a credit history that's considered good by lenders, which Cheryl discussed earlier. As previously mentioned, your credit history plays an important part in home buying, whether you can or how much it will cost via the interest rate. You are considered a, if you are considering buying a home now or sometimes in the future, you must review all three of your primary credit reports. Incredibly important. Also, have regular income and review your debt to income ratio which is what uh, Cheryl discussed earlier. Again, the traditional rule of thumb is 36%, but there are exceptions to some lenders that will approve loans for people with higher ratios. A down payment, which may range from 3% to 20%, but that just depends on the lender and the loan program. Next slide, please. For federal guaranteed loans, there are FHA or Federal Housing Administration, the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, or a VA loan, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Again, the U.S. federal um, <clears throat> government guaranteed loans include the FHA, USDA, and VA loans, including HUD loans. The U.S. federal HUD, uh, excuse me, the FHA helps provide people, um, helps people become homeowners. And with FHA loans, the lender may be able to offer you better terms than a conventional loan including down payment as low as 3.5% on the purchase price of your home. Closing costs may include the loan amount. They are financed into the loan and not due as a lump sum at closing and lower closing costs. FHA loans may be easier to qualify for, but there's a maximum loan limit, which varies by region. You have to pay the mortgage insurance premium, which is PMI, or excuse me, MIP with an FHA loan. This is similar to your PMI, and with MIP, you pay part of this cost up front at closing and every month as part of your mortgage payment. The U.S. Department of Agriculture also has a home loan guarantee program similar to FHA. The big difference is USDA loans and FHA loans is that the USDA loan only covers properties designated in rural areas. There are also VA loans. <clears throat> And these are loan guarantee programs as well. These loans are called VA, and the type of loan is only available to qualified members of the military. A VA loan does not require down payment, although you can choose to make one. They also do not have mortgage insurance premiums. Although there is upfront funding fee, the amount of the fee vary, varies based on the type of military service, down payment amount, disability status, whether you're buying a home or refinancing another mortgage or whether this is your first VA loan or if you've had one before. In addition, HUD offers other specialty loan programs. Next slide, please. There are other forms of assistance um, throughout the state and local government agencies. Some 
home buying assistance programs include down payment assistance or closing cost assistance programs, first time home buyer programs that offer down payment assistance, loans, or other forms of assistance to people buying a home for the first time or the first time in three to five years, and programs to help people in specific professions get homes in the community where they work. For example, HUD's Good Neighbor Next Door program offers homes at discount prices to law enforcement officers, teachers, firefighters, and emergency care workers. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to discuss amortization. The amount you pay each month is amortized, and this would be in terms of your monthly payment. That means the payment is calculated to ensure that you pay a portion of both principal and interest each month. That also means your payment will be the same each month, except for when your interest rate changes with an adjustable rate mortgage. <clears throat> the amortization schedule you receive from the lender will show you how much each payment's going to going towards paying down the principal and how much is going towards interest over the projected life of your mortgage. Early in the life of the loan, the majority of the payment will go towards your principal, uh, excuse me, interest and not principal. Many loans allow prepayment of principal. If this is allowed, paying just a little extra each month towards your principal can result in significant saving over the life of the loan. Next slide, please. Getting pre-qualified is an informal way of getting an estimate of how much money you can borrow. You can be pre-qualified by giving the lender some basic information over the phone, including, <clears throat> I'm sorry, over the phone, and there's no paperwork required. There's little obligation, and the pre-qualified amount is not exact. It's only an estimate. And most importantly, pre-qualification is not an approval for a loan. You can also get pre-approved. And a pre-approval is a commitment from a lender to lend you money under some conditions in which specifically, or excuse me, conditions that they specify. It helps you to get pre-approved before you look for a house. The pre-approval process lets you know how much money you can borrow and tells the seller you're prepared to buy a house. To obtain a pre-approval, you need to assemble financial records and fill out an application. You will usually need documents such as pay stubs, at least the last two or three months, your W-2s for the last two years, tax returns for the last two years, the information about your assets and debts, your recent bank statements, and proof of any additional income. You do not need to disclose any type of alimony or child support payments unless you want the lender con to consider them as income in the repayment of the loan. Next slide, please. So now that you know the basics about a mortgage, you can shop around. This is important, yet almost half of the people who get mortgages do not. Shopping for a mortgage can save you money over the life of the loan. Get a loan estimate from several different lenders. A loan estimate is the document per that's provided, um, and it provides important details about the loan that you asked for, including the APR, like we discussed earlier. Your real estate agent may suggest at least one lender, but also get written estimates from at least two other lenders. Ask other real estate professionals, friends, colleagues, or family members for recommendations. If you have a relationship with a financial institution, don't forget to consider them or even a credit union. Contact the lenders you're considering and tell them that you're ready to request a loan estimate. You don't need to provide a written document documentation yet. Generally, just need to provide some key pieces of information. Your name, your income, your social security number so they can check your credit, the address of the home you plan to purchase, an estimate of the home's value, typically the sale price, the loan amount you want to borrow, the home price minus your down payment. There are no fee for the loan estimate, but a lender may charge you a credit report fee. And ask questions to make sure you understand the information that they are providing you. Next slide, please. So again, Know your loan. Learn about your financing options for buying a home and shop around to get the best deal for you. Now I'll hand it back to Cheryl. <clears throat> that means I should probably turn on my speaker and camera, huh? Well, welcome back. Thank you very much, Rihanna. And in, in this section, we will discuss how to put together that team of professionals that's going to help you buy your home, right? 
the major steps to buying the home and where to get additional help if you're struggling to make the payments after you've got the home. Okay, so next slide. Key takeaway, definitely get help. Get good help with your home buying process. Interview before you hire, ask for references, make sure that you're doing business with and paying for the services of someone with whom you're comfortable doing business with, right? That understands your needs and not out to meet their needs, okay? Next slide. So there are many professionals who will help you with this process. One such professional will be your real estate agent, right? They're going to help you find the home that meets your needs and wants. Now, there is a whole team of other individuals um, that will help you in this process, such as an appraiser, of course, your lender, a home inspector, the title company, the escrow company, and your insurance agent. You can also use a housing counselor. Now, a housing counselor will go into much more detail with the type of information that Rihanna and I are sharing with you today. Um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, actually has a whole program where they certify and approve housing counselors. So to make sure that consumers are really prepared for the home buying decisions, right? They provide assistance at any stage of the home buying process, although contacting them early and working with a home counselor early will help you get uh, the greatest information. And also maybe they can identify resources if you're eligible for down payment assistance. Um, you can contact or, or find a uh, HUD certified housing counselor at HUD's website, www hud.gov backslash find a counselor. Okay. So who else might help you in the home buying process? Uh, there's a lot of, like we mentioned earlier, the appraiser. So the appraiser will provide an estimate of the home value for the lender, right? So the appraiser for both of you, for the, for the lender and for you, if somebody says, you know, their home is worth $800,000 and you have a professional appraiser come in and they evaluate the home and there's a lot of things that they take into consideration and they say, oh, the home is only worth $600,000. Well, you don't want to pay $800,000 for a home that's worth $600,000. And trust me, the lender is not going to lend $800,000 for a home that's worth only six hundred. dollars So you've got your appraiser, your lender, your housing inspector. Now, housing inspector comes in and identifies if there are any key issues or problems with the home before you buy it. Now, you might find that there are some issues with the home that maybe you can then negotiate with the seller on who's going to pay for the cost to repair those issues. You know, if there's, you know, a plumbing problem in the bathroom and in your mind, you're thinking you were going to remodel that bathroom anyway. So you don't want them spending a lot of money to fix it since you're going to spend money on it anyway. But maybe they'll give you an allowance back in the cost of the house. Then, of course, your title insurance, you want to make sure that the seller has the legal right to actually sell the property. And then your insurance agent, your uh, homeowner's insurance. Make sure that you're covered there. So next slide, please. Now you're going to make an offer. You've, you've gone through the process. Your credit's good. You've talked to a lender, your real estate agent. You've looked at, you know, several homes by now. You're ready. This is this. You want to make an offer. It's very complicated. It can be complicated. It's definitely exciting. Uh, your offer is what you, you're, you're stating what you're willing to pay for the home. And your real estate agent will be the one who actually handles that offer. From your agent, you as the buyer, will make the offer to their agent, the seller, who will share it with the actual party that's selling the property. Now what? Next slide, please. So in that offer, right? There's some key elements to that. So the address and description of the property, the sale price, how much are you willing to pay? 
Now there are some homes that not in today's market, but you know, sometimes you get lucky and you can pay less for a home than what they're actually listed at. More often in today's environment, you might end up paying more than what they're listed at. And then your target date for escrow closing. You know, some people are in a hurry. They want to get out of town. Maybe they want a two week escrow. Um, typically it's a 30 day escrow, but we've certainly seen escrows that go out much longer than that, depending on the circumstances. So what's your target closing date? And then the deposit, the amount of earnest money that you're willing to put down to demonstrate your commitment to buying this house. Now you want to put as low amount as possible because if you cancel, you risk losing that deposit. Okay, so your agent can certainly help you with determining all of that. Okay, next slide, please. Also in the offer is who pays for what? Who pays for the title insurance? Who pays if you're having termite inspections and the house inspection and if there's any damages? The walkthrough clause, the walkthrough clause is a commitment that allows you to go through the property one more time before signing on that dotted line uh, to make sure that, you know, the move, the seller has moved out and the property is as you expect it to be. So if you go in and you're thinking you love that chandelier and then you go through your final closing and that chandelier is gone, uh-oh, maybe you don't want to sign on that dotted line yet. Maybe you want them to reinstall that chandelier back, right? And then the date your offer expires, if there are any contingencies, and the contingencies are events that cancel the offer, that void that offer, right? And then if there are any other special requests, for example, the buyer could request that all of the appliances be included, and then any other terms, right, that you or your agent think are important to that offer. Next slide, please. Now you've made your offer. You're not going to sleep tonight, I'll tell you that. <laughs> because in response, the seller can either accept your offer and all negotiations end, right? You're committed. This is it. You're, you're now in the process, right? Now you're going to start going through that ex escrow. Uh, so your offer plus the seller's acceptance becomes a legally binding contract. Or the seller could reject your offer and can make a counter offer back to you. Maybe they want a little bit more money. You asked for the appliances, but the, the sellers are saying, no, we're taking them with us, whatever it might be. So the seller can counter offer your initial offer. Now you can reject that and go away, or you could make another counter offer, right? Or the seller could just simply reject your offer entirely and not even bother with a counter offer. They could accept another offer. Um, so as you can see, this can be complicated. Uh, and that's why it's really important to have professionals on your side to help you through this process. All right. So the home inspection, now we did talk a little bit about that, but it, it's really important. Um, it's a type of contingency, and that means that your offer is contingent on or depends on getting the results of the home inspection that, uh, that you agree to, right? So the home inspection will give you detailed information about the condition of the home, and it's more than just looking at the floor and the, and the paint colors, right? We're talking about plumbing. We're talking about electrical. You know, we're talking about things that you and I may not be aware of where with these inspectors, this is their business. They know what to look for. And they know when things are getting kind of, you know, tapped over. It is one of the most important steps in protecting you and your investment in the home buying process because it would be really awful for you to buy a home thinking all was well, just to discover that, you know, there, there are some maybe foundation issues or something else that would cost a substantial amount of money. So while you can get recommendations for a home inspector from your real estate agent, 
make sure that you're, again, getting somebody who has your best interest at heart, not somebody who wants the real estate agent to make the sale. We want somebody who has your best interest at heart. Um, and in some cases, you may even need a secondary inspection. For example, if the property you wish to purchase has unusual heating or cooling system or has well water, you may need to have somebody who is skilled in those particular areas. Uh, it's your decision whether to require a home inspection as, as a contingency to your offer. Either way, you should definitely know your rights regarding that. Okay, next slide, please. And then documents at closing. There will be a lot of documents for you to sign. When escrow is ready to close and, and you're committing to that loan, there's going to be there's going to be a stack of papers. It's, it's going to be a lot. Take your time and make sure that you understand what you're signing, though. Uh, it's not un, uncommon. I won't say it's common, but it does happen that sometimes there are as errors in the closing documents that you need to send it back and have them redraw them. Right. Um, so you've got your loan estimate and that lays out the information about the loan. Now, you should have already seen something for the loan estimate when you first talk to the lender, when uh, they have to give you a, an early disclosure. So this should be close to that early disclosure. Then you'll have your closing disclosure. And this is the form that lists all of the final terms of the loan. Uh, and all of the final closing costs, right? The details of, of who gets paid how much at closing. So your lender has to give this to you at least three days before loan closing. Then you'll have your initial escrow statement. And this is not escrow for the closing of the deal, but escrow regarding your principal interest and uh, taxes right? So this lists the costs that the lender expects to pay from your escrow account. So your, your insurance and your taxes during the first year of your loan, right? And then promissory note. The promissory note is the commitment from you to the bank to borrow X amount of money to buy the home, right? It includes the amount of money, the rate of interest, the loan payment due dates, the length of the loan, whether it's 15 years, 30 years, whatever it might be, and whether uh, whether and how payments can change, like uh, Rihanna talked about adjustable rate mortgages, and then where you send the money, where you send those payments to. It should also, it will also include payment option information, uh, like if you want it automatically deducted from your bank account. Uh, and then there's another document called a mortgage or a security instrument, like the trust deed. Uh, this document explains your rights and responsibilities as the borrower, the mortgage grants, the lender or services, the right to foreclose on your home if you fail to make those payments as you've agreed. Uh, and I believe that's it. Then there may be other documents required by state or law. Your lender should give you additional information regarding those. Uh, but if you have any questions, ask them. If they're asking you to sign something that you're not familiar with or you don't understand or you don't agree to, don't just sign it. Ask before signing. Okay, next slide, please. Then closing on a home. Oh, you're, you're at the finish line. Closing is the last step in the home buying process. At closing of escrow, the loan becomes final. So now the escrow company, not, not escrow your taxes and insurance, but the escrow company who's holding all of the money for this deal, they're going to start paying out, right? They're going to get the money from the lender and they're going to pay off the old mortgage. They're going to pay off the appraiser. They're going to make sure everybody through that process gets paid. And now you're on the line. Now, now it's you. Now you're going to start making those payments back to the mortgage company. But congratulations. You're a homeowner. This is the day to celebrate at closing, right? Now the property is yours. Now you can sleep. <laughs>
Now, then there might come times when you're unable to sleep again because life changes, right? Things happen. If during the life of your loan, from the time that you, from the time that you buy the house throughout the life of the loan, if you have any trouble making your mortgage payments, it's really important. Don't wait. As soon as you realize that you're going to have trouble making that next mortgage payment before it's even due, it's very important that you call your lender. Call your lender right away. They may be able to help you with a loan modification that will allow you to make loan payments uh, throughout throughout that struggling time. We saw a lot of that during COVID. There was a lot of deferrals. There were loan modifications that extended the life of the loan, similar to a refinance that lowered the loan payments. But contact your lender. Give them the chance to help you, right? Also, you can contact a home preservation hotline. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you can go to www.995hope.org. And I think we've got some contact information on the on another slide. Also, contact, remember we talked earlier about the HUD counselors, uh, the housing of urban, housing, yeah, Department of Housing and Urban Development. The certified housing counselors, they may be familiar with some resources that are available. There was a lot of effort made in keeping people in their homes in response to COVID. Some monies came available that helped make payments. So the HUD counselors would be able to help uh, identify those resources for you also. Also, you can contact your state housing finance agency. You can Google that. It'll, it'll give you contact information. Um, so there are options. So when you're when you get into trouble and you're finding difficulty making those payments, don't just give up. OK. And then section three, here we go. Get help with the home buying process. Right. Interview and hire your help that's there to work for you and ask for references and definitely understand what services you, you will receive and how much they will cost. And with that, I will turn it back over to Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you, uh, Rihanna, for this wonderful presentation. And I know it's a lot to take in because the home buying process is complex. But I wanted to share with you another initiative of the Alliance for Economic Inclusion called LA Saves. And the idea here is to think about saving, starting small and, and growing big. So the America Saves is the national umbrella for this campaign, and it's managed by a national nonprofit called Consumer Federation of America. And the concept is to help motivate, encourage, and support lower income households to save money, reduce debt, and build wealth. And the campaign uses research that focuses on the pr principles of behavioral economics and social marketing to change behavior. Next slide. So why save? Well, save for emergencies, save for opportunities. And as we're talking about today, buying a home, you need to save for a down payment. Now, even if you're a veteran and there's 0% down payment, you still will have some closing costs uh, and also you might want to reduce the amount you borrow and you can do that by having a down payment, even if it one's not required. So we'd like to encourage you to take the Los Angeles Saves Pledge and start saving. And where you go is to lasaves.org. Next slide. I also want to tell you that reducing debt is a way of saving because as you learned, lenders look at the ratio of how much debt you have to your income. And so you may need to focus on reducing the debt to be able to qualify for a better price loan or just even to qualify for the loan because you won't get it if your ratio is too high. So in that example where it was over 50%, you need to, that person would need to figure out how can they start working on decreasing their debt and doing so 
think about is like saving. Next slide. So taking the pledge is really easy. I mean, nobody's going to come and ask you in person, did you do it? It's not asking you for any confidential information. It has, there's four steps to it. It asks you for your name. It asks you to set a goal and it has a number of options. So for example, one of them might be home ownership. It asks you to make a plan. So how much do you want to save per month for how many months? You know, and so depending on your circumstances, maybe it's just an emergency fund you want to start with and you want to save $400. So maybe you're just going to start saving $25 a month. But perhaps you're now seriously thinking about you're buying your home and you're saying, okay, what can I do? I'm going to start saving $100 a month or whatever the number might be to get you to the amount of down payment you're going to need to purchase a home. And then to keep in touch, it asks for an email address, a phone number, and a zip code. And if you provide the phone number, you'll be able to choose whether you'd like to receive text messages with tips and advice. You're only going to get one or two of these a month, but I find them very valuable to help me keep on track for my savings goal. Next slide. This is what the website actually looks like. And as I say, you can go to lasaves.org and make your plan. Start really thinking about how you're going to uh, get ready to purchase your home. Next slide. Now, I know we've shared a lot of information today, and you may be interested in other topics. So the FDIC has a new online game and resources on everyday financial topics, and it's called How Money Smart Are You? And it's also available in Spanish. Next slide. And this, what it, this is what it looks like. It covers 14 different topics, including home ownership, and each game has rounds. So it allows you to build upon the knowledge in each one of these topics, and you earn coins. and when you get enough coins, you win the game, which means you've achieved a certain level of knowledge of that particular topic. It's fun to do, it's easy to do, and it just helps you get more information about some of the financial topics that you may not, uh, that you may have questions about. Next slide. So today we wanted to make sure that you do something with the information that we shared. You need to take action and think about what are you going to do with this? How are you going to do it? And then, for example, if, you know, after this, you say, I'm going to get ready to purchase a home. And these are the things I, I need to do. I'm going to pull my credit report. I'm going to start getting on a plan to save X amount of money every month. Um, and then share your plan with someone. Uh, you know, a trusted friend. It's like when you decide to go on a diet, if you tell somebody you're going to be more accountable than if you just think about you got to go on a diet and you never get around to it. The FDIC has a number of additional resources and you can find them at fdic.gov backslash education to learn more. Next slide. These are some additional resources that we discussed today. So obtaining your credit report for free, finding a HUD approved counseling agency, home preservation hotline. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has a number of uh, information on this topic. The LA Saves Pledge. And if perchance you haven't opened a bank account yet, we have information about opening a bank account or an account at a credit union because having an account will be also part of your getting ready to purchase a home. Next slide. So I really want to thank you for your participation and um, ask Caroline if we have any questions. Hi. Okay. So yeah, we had, um, I think a few questions just came in. So the first one is, what are the first steps I should take when buying a home? And I'll take that. Can you hear me? Okay. Definitely look at your credit reports, all three of them. Look at your credit reports. 
If there's anything on there that is not correct, if there's any kind of mistakes, take steps to get that corrected. File a dispute immediately. Uh, you know, we, we I think all, all three of us, Mary and Rihanna and I have said, you know, how important your credit plays because that will determine not just whether or not you get the loan, but how much you pay for that loan in the interest rate over the life. So absolutely start looking at your credit report and then save. I mean, you should be saving already anyway, but definitely save and be prepared to be patient, <laughs> to be patient throughout this process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do I get a down payment assistance? Like, how does that work? How do I? <laughs> Rihanna, you want to take that one? Down payment assistance? Sure. Um, in terms of down payment assistance, there's multiple ways of getting down payment assistance. Um, you're able to, there's different nonprofits that can provide down payment assistance. Um, there's different lenders um, that will provide down payment assistance, um, such as the WISH program. Um, for example, a lot of institutions participate in the WISH program. So you would be able to um, ask for those particular funds. They have different um, processes that you would go through in terms of down payment assistance programs. Um, you'd have to qualify for that. Um, so it's very similar in terms of like an application process. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ways. Um, I know that depending on the different loan programs that you would potentially uh, participate in, for example, HUD has different types of programs. Um, I know specifically with HUD, you can actually get a second uh, mortgage and that particular mortgage would be for something similar that Cheryl was talking about in terms of um, getting the house, like if you need doors redone, if the house needs new windows or something along those lines, they would provide some of that. Um, and they also, I believe, do have some form of down payment assistance and some of that as well. So. Okay, thank you so I, much. I would just like to ask, oh, add Caroline, that the state of California, through the California Housing Finance Agency, also has some down payment assistance programs that mm -hmm. often uh, go bundled with the first mortgage and has delayed payment on them. Sometimes they're mm -hmm. forgivable. Sometimes they don't have to be paid until 30 years if you're having a 30-year loan or when you sell your house and by then it you know, it may have increased in value. So, if, you know, be sure to see if you might qualify for any of these other programs and that your lender should be able to assist you as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh gosh, there's like one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I've heard of people having many offers declined. How can I make my offer more appealing? That's the magic. Do you, do you want me to do you want me to take this one just because I just I just went through the yeah. house, the process. Um, so in this particular market, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult, unfortunately. I had a fantastic realtor. So again, not just shopping for the loan, but shop for your realtor. Um, it's very important to have a really good comfort level with your realtor. Um, and in terms of offer. I, I don't want to say, because like I said, in this particular market, you definitely have to offer more than what the list price is. But um, I think what made my offer really appealing was uh, there was a letter. It was a personalized mm -hmm. letter. Um, I heard of some sellers that are not taking those anymore, but it never hurts to ask whether or not they'd be willing to accept one. Um, and so I had a personalized letter of why my family really wanted the home. And that seller can kind of make a connection with you through the letter. So that definitely makes the offer more appealing. Um, also removing certain contingencies. Mm -hmm. So if you have a house already, um, you know, ensuring that you already have a, a, a buyer lined up or maybe the house is already in escrow, which is what I was doing. I was selling and buying at the same time. Um, and then if you have any retirement, if you're willing to, um, you know, pledge additional down payments, um, and again, if you're looking for payment assistance, having all of that documentation up front. So ensuring that you kind of have those those steps. So if you need down payment assistance, make sure you have the down payment assistance. You can provide a letter that you have the down payment assistance. So it's really having all the documentation and having a full packet 
and presenting yourself in a in a a light that you seem um, willing, eager, um, and of course, somebody who you're buying the home from, they have an attachment from that home, um, mm -hmm. so they want to know that the house is going to go into good hands. So that's something else I think from a personal aspect that really really helps. Thank you so much. That's always a thing. Like you want to get yours, but yeah, great, um, great information. Thank you all so much for a great presentation. I learned a lot. I wanted to let everyone know if um, this presentation is recorded and will be on the Los Angeles Public Library's YouTube channel shortly. So if anyone missed anything, it's available. Yes, youtube.com forward slash Los Angeles Library. They can rewatch it again. And then we also have this Thursday, June 9th at 12 p.m. There's a Spanish language version of this program. So, you know, you can check that out as well. And for more information on the Spanish language program or just any of our programs, you can go to our online calendar at lapl.org forward slash what's on forward slash calendar and i think it's going to be displayed but if <laughs> just go to lapl.org and it's the events it's the online calendar and thank you all all again and i, get, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day thank you so much bye everyone thank you, thank you. bye thank you bye